Okay, so I'll pick up from where I left yesterday, and I'll, today I'll try to go into more detailed biological uh, problems and try to see how modeling uh, and interaction with experimental data can really account for some very nice systems. So that's the summary. There are cells, we all know them, they replicate, and that's the basic phenomenon that's really characteristic of living systems. Right? That's where I left yesterday. So how do we think about um, trying to understand large-scale dynamical descriptions of living systems, given the fact that we seem to know the uh, microscopic interactions to a reasonably good accuracy. Okay. I particularly work in the context of developmental biology, so I'd like to understand how, starting from a single cell, the organisms go through a, a cycle to really generate the large-scale adult uh, creature. So, as most of you know, but probably the physicists will be new. So you would have an egg cell which gets fertilized by a sperm, it forms a zygote, and then the zygote just cleaves into many, many, many tiny, tiny cells. And up to this point, the cells just get become uh, smaller in size, but they increase in number. And at some point, they start to sort of reorganize themselves. So they reorganize themselves and define a, a internal, external shapes. And this is something that every one of us has gone through. And typically after that, they differentiate and then they form these large-scale creatures. So gastrulation is a fantastic process. If you just think about it, pause for a minute and think about it. So you had a ball of cells, which is really a three-dimensional ball of cells, and you have to rearrange things such that you define your inside, your outside, your internal organs, tubes, and so on. It's a fantastic physical process and which someday I want to work on. This is what you will see if you see a typical movie of development in the microscope. So this is a zebrafish embryo starting just a couple of uh, minutes or maybe an hour after the fertilization. You watch it in the microscope and you see the emergence of these large scale patterns in, in the way the organism shapes up. Right? So this is just about half a millimeter in size, the whole creature. And is it working? And it really does it in a very remarkable, precise manner. So that's what we want to understand. So the kind of physical problems that I'm particularly interested in is trying to look at these large-scale development. So you can define development broadly, broadly, very, very broadly, into two different classes. One is how do you make different kinds of cells? How do you specialize? That is uh, fate decision maps on which we heard just now. The other thing is uh, how do you actually make the shape of the creature? How do you establish axis? So from a physics perspective, you start from a bunch of cells, more or less isotropic, and you don't know what is X, Y, Z, which is head, tail, front, back, left, right, no axis defined, no coordinate system established. The creature establishes coordinate systems, defines its axis, and then starts building up its parts. Right? So there are the anterior posterior axis, the dorsal ventral, left, right, and so on. There's also the segmentation that comes up. So I'll try to discuss in some detail about the establishment of the head, tail, or the anterior posterior axis for a particular example system that I worked on. Uh, so that's the typical way we proceed, and we pick up a couple of um, examples of uh, model systems. We can't say everyone, but we pick things which are amenable to experimental uh, uh, investigation, also sort of representative of the diverse class of living systems that we can find on Earth. So the standard model, for example, is Drosophila, which has been uh, worked on extensively for many, many decades. And if you watch a movie of uh, the development of Drosophila, it's a fantastic process. This is something happening in a closed chamber. Um, in response to certain organized signals, and you see the emergence of these fantastic shapes inside the creature, and then finally uh, it hatches and goes out and goes on to um, its life cycle. Okay. Okay. And it hatches out. There you go. All right. But how do you make these patterns? So we are nowhere near understanding the uh, patterning of the entire creature in all time scales and length scales. We know a few subsystems which we try to understand in depth. So remember, yesterday I told you that there are simple physical processes of trying to understand patterning via reaction diffusion mechanisms. So particularly I had a one-dimensional system, a molecule which is being expressed at one location, we call it, for example, and then it diffuses and decays. So that sets up some profile. So this x-axis is the so space and y is some concentration of the molecules. Now, if you have just an exponentially decaying profile, you can read off that and also pattern. That's the French flag model that we discussed. 
but there could also be certain signaling networks that come up. For example, this A, which is getting a pattern because of a certain signal that the mother deposited. So that may be produces B and C, but A represents D, and then a complicated circuit that C plus D gives B, B represents C, B, B makes more of B, C makes more of C. So you can cook up a concoction of chemical networks, which will be particular for every kind of a system that you look at, and in general, be able to certain generate certain patterns, for example, periodic patterns. These, for instance, will turn out to be the segments that define the creature. That's how you make different parts of the creature, head, tail, torso, trunk, tail, whatever, all the kinds of things. So one is to write pictures like this. The other thing is to actually measure data. So we can actually measure quantitatively the concentration profiles of each one of the proteins that we know. And in the case of Drosophila, we know a huge number of them and how they pattern the system. And the patterns that come up in these concentration fields are really the patterns that will eventually drive the development of the creature into its various forms. So we still don't know the full process. We know that there is a, a correlation between the patterns that you see at the early level and the patterns that you see at the uh, adult level. And like I discussed yesterday, a classical way of thinking about it is, is the so-called positional information model. Uh, this, what this model really establishes a coordinate system for the embryo, right? So you define an origin and you define an axis. That's, so you have a way of measuring distances relative to each other. So like we discussed yesterday, so there are example systems where the production of a morphogen in a particular region, given by some source term, and its diffusion and degradation can set up exponential profiles of the concentration. This can be used in the positional information model to actually pattern the embryo. How does it do that? The embryo reads the concentration profile of some morphogen, decoid for example, and does a threshold information processing. So that means if the concentration profile is above threshold one, use that to do some genetic information, blah, 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 and the fate map becomes, say, blue cells. If it's below threshold one, but above threshold two, make white cells. And if it's below threshold two, make red cells, and so on and so forth. So one can really generate mechanisms of trying to read the positional information about where you are, what is the axis, and use that to pattern the embryo. So we have abundant examples, I mean, these are just two of them, where people can actually measure the concentration fields, and they seem to obey very, very well the, this picture. So two examples are the patterning of the fly wing disc, and the patterning of the neural tube in chick, for example. So this is one way of patterning. The other way of patterning, so I just want to emphasize this once again. So this is, these are not patterns that come up spontaneously. These are patterns that arise because you are driving information or are providing signaling at a particular region of the embryo. Right? So these are not, this is not an instability of the homogeneous state. This is a system where it's being driven because you put in some information in some region of space and probably time, and that system is reading that and patterning itself. So this is what we would call signaling. The other class of systems, again, which fall in reaction diffusion patterns, which I discussed yesterday, are the Turing patterns. These are spontaneous patterns. So you have a system of partial differential equation or a system of interacting chemicals, which can also diffuse around. And if your parameters are right, the system becomes spontaneously unstable to fluctuations and can lead to the generation of periodic patterns. So again, people have investigated this from a very long time. Again, not a complete representative example, but a few I've picked from recent uh, studies. One can look at emergence of periodic patterns in the fish stripes or digitation patterns in the mammalian limb, and people have associated these things to Turing patterns. There's a trouble here. I mean, if you are in a situation where the patterns come about spontaneously, um, when will the pattern arise? And where will the pattern arise? That's a trouble, right? Because you have no control on that. If, it, these, if these are patterns that are coming up just because the system is in an unstable state and there is a small fluctuation and the fluctuation gets amplified and the system then sets up a pattern. So then you don't know when will the pattern come. That's pretty bad in biology. You don't want to pattern every now and then. You want to pattern in response to signals that come during the developmental process. So what controls these patterns. Control in where they come, control in when they come. That is what I want to show you today. But I'll, that's the last part of the story, but I, I'll, I'll go very slowly and carefully. 
So again, the same summary slide. That so there are patterns which come about because of spontaneous instabilities, or there are patterns which come about because there are signaling centers. So in these two cases, there are the classical way of thinking about them are signaling centers which are static. A particular region is more important than the others, and that drives the pattern. But if you just watch development, so the R.C. Thompson was quoted last week as well. This is the 101st year of this book. If you really watch development, again the movie, and think about the following. If I just have concentration fields of certain molecules and so on and so forth, and they can form patterns, either in response to signals or spontaneous patterns, is that enough? I mean, it's hard to believe that you can create a creature which is patterned not only in the expression of certain concentration fields, but also has patterns in geometry, the shape of the organism, without involving mechanics. How is that possible? So, the R.C. Thompson did speculate very early on that mechanics must be crucial. It can't be mechanics alone, I mean, at least in animals. There has to be a talk, crosstalk between mechanics, signaling, and somehow this is what is really generating the three dimensional shape and functional form of the creature that we know. So, I would like to understand how are mechanical forces generated in cells and tissues, in particular in animal cells and tissues. And how are they involved, and particularly the physical principles, in generating what I would call mechanochemical patterns? So these are not patterns which are coming just because of mechanical interactions or just because of chemical. These are things which are get messed up. Chemistry influences mechanics, mechanics feedback on chemistry, and so on. And somehow these things can can we build up simple physical pictures which can be tested experimentally and try to see if these things make sense. Eventually, the idea is that. We should be able to use the information buried in these patterns that you get, either in the chemical concentrations and therefore coupling to mechanics, and shape the embryo. Therefore, one should be able to go from unpatterned embryos in response to signals. You should be able to pattern embryos, patterns in terms of concentration fields, orientation fields, and so on. And if there's mechanics involved in these patterns, the mechanics can be used to actually shape the embryo. And once you shape the embryo, that feeds back on the chemical patterns, and that's feedback on the shape, and so on and so forth. And that's really the big picture of the kind of things that I want to do, or I do. How do you generate mechanical forces? So something we've discussed a couple of times. The primary element for generating mechanical forces in cells and tissues is the cytoskeleton. In animal cells, it's essentially the actomyosin cytoskeleton. So the actomyosin cytoskeleton is a meshwork of filaments of actin close to the periphery of the cell. It's a meshwork random meshwork of polymeric filaments, and there are motor proteins, which are not shown here, which really sit on the filaments, and the, uh, the non-equilibrium ATP-consuming activity of the motor proteins is really what leads to the mechanical force generation in these elements. So what's the physics there? So again, going back, so I have a cell, a typical cell, I have the cell membrane, and just beneath the cell membrane is this structure called the actomyosin cortex, so actin filaments in green and myosin motors shown in red. The motors and the filaments can be either associated to the surface or they could be in the cytosol. When they are associated to the surface, they're typically in a polymeric state. They form filamental structures. In the cytosol, they're mostly in the monomeric state. This is just a broad picture. Now, this structure is not static in the sense like if you think of a piece of rubber, it's something which holds its neighbors together and structures are it's really like an elastic material on long time scales. That's not what this structure this structure undergoes what is called turnover, in the sense that the filaments polymerize, depolymerize from the surface, and so this polymerization, depolymerization really relaxes any elastic stresses beyond the turnover time scale. So the picture is that if you really watch the cortex, it's really a dynamic network. So it is elastic on very short time scales, but if you look at long time scales, long compared to the typical turnover time scale, this meshwork really becomes like a fluid. So that's the structure of the cortex. So it's really a meshwork of filaments interspersed with lots of motor proteins. The motor proteins consume ATP, which is the fuel for biological process, and they actually walk on the filaments. They tug the filaments, and this tugging forces is essentially what generates mechanical forces in the cortex. Now, one would like to answer if, I mean, is it really the case that these molecular motors, which act on very, very tiny scales, are they the things that can really lead to patterning at very large developmental scales and times, right? I mean, that's something to be asked. I'll just play a movie, try to guess what this is, and I'll show you some one particular example of how these things are indeed driving morphogenetic changes at very large scales. 
So just watch the movie and try to guess what this is. Any guesses? It's the eye. Okay, so people at the back can get a better perspective. <laughs> yeah, so it's indeed eyelid closure. So it turns out if you look at eyelid closure in mammalian systems, mouse in particular, this is a developmental process which is typically akin to a wound closure, wound healing problem. So there is a, there's a gap, which is like a, uh, the eyeball, and then the eyeball gets closed by the epidermal layers of the cell. And this is really like a healing problem. So you get a scratch, a couple of days after later, the cells come and sit down. So it turns out, as we all know, mice and cats are born blind, and there's a sheet of layer of cells which is really covering the eye eyeball. And if you don't uh, allow the eyeball to close up, it, the eyelid gets exposed, and then it's pretty bad. We worked on this system. So this is really a... Oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you the time. So this, from starting to the end, really takes about two and a half days. It's a pretty long time scale. And, and this is about, let's say, a couple of centimeters in size. We looked at this system and did the following. So since we have cells, which are marked with some histone labeled GFP thing, we can track the cells. When we track the cells, we have the positions of the cells. So therefore, at every instant of time, we can calculate the mechanically important quantities, like strain. we can calculate the uh, what's called the strain rate tensor. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. And once you calculate the strain rate tensor, we can look at the components, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the tensor. That gives you the principal directions of compression and extension. And if you look at the profile across the, uh, the, the closing front of the eyelid, there seems to be some peak of the mechanical extension and compression profiles. This is just from experimental data. If you just look at the expression of actin and myosin, there's an exact peak precisely where the mechanical compression and extension is maximum. And this peak really shifts in time. This is not really explaining things, but this is just showing that even at these large scales, this is over two and a half days in time, it's really actin myosin expression which is really driving these large scale morphogenetic changes. But how does actomyosin contractility lead to pattern formation? That's the basic question we wanted to ask. So we wanted to ask patterns with mechanics, and then we said mechanics is coming because of actomyosin contractility. So how does actomyosin contractility lead to patterns? So first thing, actomyosin uh, activity generates mechanical forces, right? So let's just try to build a conceptual model, and then I'll come to the mathematics part of it. So if I have a patch of the actomyosin cortex with some motor sprinkled there, it typically contracts. You just have a patch and you just watch it in time, it just contracts. It's, it's a contractile uh, element. If you have another patch, but with a higher density of motor coupons, okay? So that'll also contract, the contractile forces is higher. So the key idea is the following. So suppose this is actually a connected patch. So that means there is a gradient in the motor protein concentration, and a gradient in the motor protein concentration will generate a gradient in the contractile tension in the actomyosin cortex. So immediately, if you just look at this, it's intuitively clear that this will have a flow from the left to the right. So what's the take-home message? That if you have a myosin gradient, so therefore you have a contractility gradient, that leads to flows. What we want to do is to try to establish a theory for understanding how we actually can quantify this very, very uh, nicely and see if this can really uh, be said in a very quantitative fashion. So. One favorite example in the lab of Stefan Grill in Dresden, where I worked, uh, is, is, is the Seligan zygote. So this is a one cell, uh, the Seligan, Seligan zygote. So GFP attacked uh, myosin is what you're looking at. So there are, the first thing is that the, there are patches of myosin. So myosin is not homogeneously distributed. And the typical patch is about a couple of microns in size. The other thing to notice is that if you catch hold of one of the spots, you'll see that there is a large scale flow from one end of the embryo to the other. Remember, this is confocal, so you're looking at the bottom plane, so you're just looking at the patch of the cortex at the bottom half of the cell. Now, this flow, we can actually quantify it, in the sense that we can do a classical fluid dynamics technique, that is, you follow the uh, movies in time, and just look at cross-correlation, and so we can figure out the local fluid velocity of the cortex. So remember, this is a flow happening on the surface of the cell, it's not a 3D flow, the cortex is just a layer beneath the cell, and so the flow is on the surface of the cell. So we can actually look at the system and really measure the hydrodynamic velocity field. Once you know the time rates, frame rates, and you know your microscope resolution, it's very easy to convert this into a real number, microns per minute. We can do that, and you can just, for statistics, segment it along the y direction and look at the profile across the x, and you get a profile. So there is a profile of myosin 
there's more myosin on the left compared to the right. And concomitantly, there is a profile of the, active, uh, the hydrodynamic flow. So this is a real experimental measurement. And look at the units. This is a really in microns per minute. So it's a real meter per whatever, length per time unit for the microns. So how do we understand these flows? That's the question that I want to understand. So look at what I have next. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to. So this is where I wanted to switch to on the blackboard and go ahead. So we talked about thermodynamics and thermodynamic equilibrium. I want to build uh, a theory of how do you actually write down equations for, for example, the flow of myosin and so on and so forth. How do you calculate these things? Can you write down mathematical equations? Can you actually derive an equation which will, which you can look at the experimental data and try to make some very quantitative predictions? So like we all know, thermodynamics is the study of the large scale properties of uh, systems, uh, material uh, media. And uh, a thermodynamically, uh, a system at thermodynamic equilibrium is a system which is at thermal, mechanical, and a chemical equilibrium. And typical examples, for example, for a mechanical equilibrium, a uh, uh, microtubule growing against a wall, or proteins settling down in a density gradient, and so on. In chemical equilibrium, there are plenty of examples. Any kind of chemical reaction between enzymes and so on and so forth are chemical equilibrium. So if, you are, if your system is at thermodynamic equilibrium, there are a couple of parameters that are enough to describe the system. You don't need to think about every protein, every molecule, every uh, particle sitting there. There's a couple of large-scale parameters, pressure, temperature, and so on. And basically, the laws of thermodynamics say energy is conserved, entropy increases. The rest two don't matter much for biology. But that's not what we want to do. If the system was at thermodynamic equilibrium, it would be dead. So we want to put up the system away from thermodynamic equilibrium. So therefore, we want to understand how do you do the physics of systems which are put up from thermodynamic equilibrium. So we, there is this standard procedure in physics called hydrodynamics. Hydrodynamics doesn't mean the physics of water. It's a more general process. Typically, it turned out that the physics of water was what was, liquids was what was conventionally done. And the mechanism is, the physical mechanism is the same. So if you have thermodynamic variables, say pressure and temperature, which are actually functions of position and time. So typically, when you do thermodynamics, say temperature, pressure. You don't say pressure here, temperature. That's a system out of equilibrium. Suppose now the system is out of equilibrium in the sense that the pressure and the temperature are functions of space and time. But if there is local thermodynamic equilibrium, this is what Sandeep had talked about, quasi-equilibrium, such that the spatial variations are very, very slow. Space-time variations of pressure and temperature are very, very slow compared to the microscopic scales. So there's a typical distance between molecules or the typical time the molecules take to collide. And if the variation in space and time of these thermodynamic variables is very slow compared to these time scales, you can still do what is called local thermodynamic equilibrium. So hydrodynamics really describes how do you do the dynamics of such systems, and can we actually predict the space-time evolution of thermodynamic quantity? So if you take the system and you don't do anything to it, of course it will relax back to equilibrium. Thermodynamic state is the equilibrium state. So eventually there will be forces, like for example if you have pressure gradients, they will drive flows. If you have concentration gradients, they'll have particle fluxes, and they will equilibrate. So standard stuff that we do. But the point of doing the physics of living systems, you drive the system with energy. So you maintain it out of equilibrium constantly. So you put in a flux of energy, the food you eat typically, and, and that's really what really drives the system out of your thermodynamic equilibrium. And so there's a constant flux of energy, and the constant flux of energy really drives the system out of thermodynamic equilibrium, and that's the physics that we want to understand. So there's a caveat, so we don't know the non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. And so there's no, there's no such thing called non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. Like in equilibrium statistical mechanics, there's a prescription. What is there is a bunch of techniques that we have, which has worked from experience. So this and that, and there isn't, if I give you a generic non-equilibrium system and ask you to calculate the many body properties, nobody knows, even in physics. But how do you build a system? How do you build a theory for a, for a dynamic uh, variable, which is just slightly perturbed from equilibrium, but there are spatio-temporal variations of the hydrodynamic variables. So the physics is very simple. This is a standard procedure that we know from several decades. So let's say you take a glass of water, okay? And uh, if you just don't do anything to it, it's at equilibrium. It's a thermal, chemical, and uh, mechanical equilibrium. But just put up, squash it, squash it, heat it, do something to that. Put your finger, pull it out. It locally disturbs the hydrodynamic equilibrium, hydrodynamic equilibrium. But the system will want to come back to thermodynamic equilibrium. That's the lowest minimal energy state. 
let it relax, uh, let it relax. So most of the molecular degrees of freedom will relax instantaneously, you won't even notice the change. But certain variables, density, momentum, will take longer times. These are what are called the hydrodynamic variables. For example, pressure, temperature, these are variables which relax slowly, they take time to relax. It's the physics of these variables that we can write a very good theory for. Well, are there examples or is it just positing theory? No, there are plenty of examples, even in the living systems, even in the living world. For example, fluid mechanics is a hydrodynamic theory. The water flow in a pipe is, is a hydrodynamic theory. Sound, the fact that you're hearing me is hydrodynamics. There's vibrations of density that's coming to you. Even in the living systems, people have used the ideas of hydrodynamics to construct theories for looking at suspensions of uh, swimming bacteria, the cytoskeleton, that's the, uh, that's the job for today, flocks of birds, swarms of fish. The scale is not important. You shouldn't think that this, this is a theory which will do for everything. You're basically looking at a collection of objects and you're looking at properties which are much, much, which exist on scales which are much, much larger than the microscopic constituents. Not a single bird, but a swarm of birds. Not a single molecule, but a bunch of molecules. And that's the kind of a theory that we can write down for hydrodynamics. And what I want to do is to develop an active hydrodynamical theory for the actomyosin cortex and tell you how those flows are coming. So I'll go slow, then it'll get uh, into the details of the experiment. So if you have some questions, you can free feel free to stop. So I want to introduce the idea of coarse graining. So how do you build a hydrodynamic theory? Do you look at every molecule? Suppose you want to do it for a glass of water. No, I mean, that's, that's not a hydrodynamic theory per se. You really want to look at dynamical uh, parameters and fields which are characteristic of the large scales that you're looking at. So a glass of water can be thought of as a dielectric medium. You can really think of the charges in each of the molecules. Or you can go up in scale and look at it as a diffusive medium or a viscous medium or a flowing medium or forget everything and think of it like a lattice. You can do at various levels of description. What level should I use? I mean, this is a question of modeling, right? I mean, what is the description? Should I think of every possible thing? Should I write down a quantum mechanical equation? Well, it really depends on what you can measure. What are the things that you can measure and what are the things that you want to understand and describe? There's no point in writing a theory for something which you can't measure. Sure, or if you can write a theory like this and then get to levels where you can measure, that's very useful, the experimental uh, system. So if you have more and more details of the description, you need more and more complicated theories because there are more and more parameters. One could ask what are the simplest theories or the simplest kind of modeling at the level that I can measure. And then we can refine it slowly and build up more and more complicated theories. So the way I'll try to derive a hydrodynamics for the cortex is by looking at a general prescription for writing hydrodynamics for many particle systems. So I'll have a glass of water again. So I'll think about small volume elements. And I'll look at small volume elements and I'll try to understand, for example, how the density in the small volume element changes. So the small compared to what? Small compared to the size of the system, but large compared to the molecular size. Even if I have a small volume, there are many, many molecules. I can have a million molecules or billion molecules. But still, it's very small compared to the whole size of the glass. So I, I take systems like this, and I want to build hydrodynamic descriptions for them. So these volumes can also move. That's the flow. That's the flow that you see in a, in, a, in a pipe of water, for example, right? So, but again, the flow or the velocity that you're talking about is not the velocity of the molecules. The molecules are doing random walk, just like what we did yesterday. But if you look at the average velocity of the molecules over a coarse grained volume, that's what you get as a smooth hydrodynamic flow or a deterministic description of the system, right? And what are the kind of things that we want to write a hydrodynamic field for? We want to write for density of the, of the molecules, how many molecules are there in a given volume. And if the particles are not simple point particles or spheres, but they're really rods, we also want to talk about orientation. For example, think of actomyosin, actin, which is a filament, and you want, want to talk about the orientation field of high. But these elements can also flow, whether it be rods or spheres, they can also flow, the hydrodynamic flow. So we want to write hydrodynamic equations for the flow as well. How do we write down hydrodynamic equations? The way we write down hydrodynamic equations, like I said earlier, is that we look at the quantities that are defined and very slowly on long time scales, long, slow, very slowly on long length scales. And for a simple fluid, just as an illustration, there are only two of them. One is the density field, the total mass is conserved. The other is a momentum density. The total momentum is conserved if there's no external forces. So you write down an equation of motion for the density and the momentum density, the mass density and the momentum density. How do you write them? Well, the total mass is conserved. 
So if you have a small volume element, the way you think about volume conservation or number conservation, I have a small volume element, the shape doesn't matter. Now you know that obviously the total mass of the system, if you integrate over all space, should be a constant. You can either create particles nor destroy particles. So if that's the case, and if I look at a small volume dV, how can the total amount of material in this volume change? Well, you can't create or destroy. The only way it can change is because something went out or something came in. So therefore, if you ask the rate of change of the volume, the rate of change of the mass inside this small volume dV, can only change because there was there was a bunch of particles which either went out of the volume or came into the volume. This is like a conservation law. So the total mass can change in the volume only if something went in or something came out. So that's the conservation law that you write down. And that, if you write down in a local form, gives you the continuity equation that I wrote down. A little bit of calculus involving some standard theorems will tell you that the equation of motion for the density will be the continuity equation that you know on many with momentum density. But the current of particles is essentially the momentum density. right? So it's the flux of particles, how many particles are going out per unit area, per unit time. And that's really the momentum density. So the momentum density is the current for the conserved variable, which is the density, mass density. Now this is for mass. What about momentum? Well, surely momentum is also conserved, right? That's what is essential Newton's law. And so if you look at the total amount of momentum in a simple volume, well, that momentum can change because some momentum came in or some momentum went out. It's a bit weird of a quantity. But that's essentially the idea of a conservation law. Right? Something can change because something came in or something went out. Now, the density was a scalar, and so the current of density was a vector. The momentum is a vector, and so therefore the current of momentum should be a tensor. And that's essentially what you have. If you look at local momentum conservation in a volume, So this will just be some integral over the stress tensor, over the surface. Essentially, the stress tensor is a measure of the momentum current, flux of momentum. So density equation, we are done. So now we want to understand the momentum equation. How do you actually get the momentum current? Or basically, how do you try to model the stress tensor? So I remember, I'm just writing down Newton's law, nothing more than that. Newton's law just says, look at the rate of change of momentum. That's the total force. Now, if you define this thing called the stress tensor, which I denoted by sigma here, capital sigma, that will be related to the total force in a certain volume by taking the divergence of the stress tensor. Nothing more than that. And now, really, the point boils down to how do you model the stress tensor? So for a simple fluid, the stress tensor turns out to have two parts. Again, you know both of these. One is because there is a pressure gradient. So you have a pipe, pressure is more here and less here, so that will drive flow like this. So a gradient of pressure drives flow, so which means that's the one of the contributions to the stress tensor. So the pressure, if you remember, is isotropic. So I is like a, a identity tensor or identity matrix. So sigma is a second rank tensor. So there is a contribution that is coming from the pressure. If you have a gradient in pressure, that drives flow. So therefore, the pressure itself is a part of the stress tensor. The second part, it comes from the viscous drag. So again, you know this. So if you have a liquid and you shear the top half of the liquid, there will be layers of the liquid which are at relative velocities with respect to each other. And these relative velocities create shear gradients. This is the standard viscous thing. And that shear turns out to be proportional to 
the gradients of the viscosity. I don't know if I should write the full thing. Okay, I'll write the full thing. So what you basically need to understand is that you're looking at a velocity field and you're looking how the velocity field changes with respect to space. So that itself becomes a complicated object like a second rank tensor. And that part with some coefficient called the coefficient of viscosity, the shear viscosity, contributes to the stress. If you understand this, fine. If you don't, it doesn't matter. It's just saying it's the gradients of velocity. And so therefore, if you take this expression for the stress tensor, put it in the second law of Newton, you get an equation for the flow. That's the celebrated Navier-Stokes equation. So that tells you that if you have a pressure gradient, you generate flows, and that's opposed by viscous gradients in the flow. Now, we just had the following thing, right? So, DDT of the momentum density is the minus divergence of the stress tensor. This is what we learn in school. The rate of change of momentum is equal to total force. But after some time, we also learn the following, that there are frictional forces, there are drag forces, and things like that. At some point, when we learn the damped harmonic oscillator, we say things like it's overdamped. So which means inertia is really negligible. Basically, if you have a system and you apply a force, and the system moves in response to the force. If you remove the force, the system keeps moving at the same velocity. That's Newton's second law. However, if friction is so high, that whatever the momentum you give, it can't sustain, it just dissipates, dissipates very quickly. Turns out you need to have a continuous application of force to maintain any motion. That's the low Reynolds number limit. So typically, if you have... I always screw this up. It's U L by nu with nu is eta by rho. If you have a flow which is happening with a typical velocity u on a length scale l in a viscous fluid of density rho and shear viscosity eta, you can show this number called Re Reynolds number is a dimensionless number. And this number really tells you whether inertia is important or viscous forces are important. And in biology, you can do this calculation. It's a classical calculation by Bergen, Purcell, or many, many things. For example, for equally, Bergen, Purcell estimated this. Reynolds number is like 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8. So inertia is negligible. What you can do is to just knock off inertia. And therefore, Newton's second law just boils down to saying sum of all the forces equal to zero, force balance. Or in terms of the stress tensor, the divergence of the stress tensor must be zero. Okay? So this is how we modeled a simple fluid, like water. Now we come to uh, something which is peculiar to biological systems. What are called active fluids. So remember, I told you that the cortex is a, is a fluid on time scales longer than the turnover time scales. And the fluid is not a simple fluid because there are molecular motors which are sitting there consuming ATP, tugging on the filaments. So that generates additional stresses. So for a simple fluid, there is a passive stress which is the pressure and the viscous stress. But for a fluid which is active and is driven by motors, there is an additional contribution, which is the active stress. And so therefore, Newton's second law, or the low Reynolds number limit of that, just turns out to be a balance between pressure, viscous drag, and divergence of the active stress. So now we come back to the system that we are really interested in. So that, this is the actomyosin cortex. There are flows that are happening in the actomyosin cortex. And we, were, we said that we can actually measure the flows and we can quantify the flows. So we can get the source of the flows, which is really the myosin expression, myosin level, and the hydrodynamic flows, which we have measured. Incredible. Okay. So how do we write a theory for this system? So that's how we write a theory. For this. So now we look at the hydrodynamics of the cortex. So just like I did here, we look at a hydrodynamic element, which means length and time scales much, much longer than the typical turnover time scales, typical molecular time scales, and so on. And we can write down uh, an expression for the stress. So I've dropped the pressure term. The technical detail, if you're interested, I can tell you why you can drop the pressure term. 
So there's only a viscous stress. I've written in a simple fashion, forgot all the tensorial things like here. Just the velocity and the gradient of the velocity with the shear coefficient gives you the shear stress. Plus an active stress. That's the part that comes because there are motors. You do that and then you look at force balance. You remember, no inertia, so therefore all forces must add up to zero. So there are two forces. One is the internal forces because there are stress gradients. And now for the cortex, there's an additional thing. So remember, there's a thin film sitting on top of a cytosol. There's also a membrane on top. So if you try to push that thin film, there'll be frictional drag. This is in addition to the viscous drag. The viscous drag comes because of in-plane velocity gradients. The frictional drag comes because there is a static material, for example, the cytosol, and you're pushing it past that. So the lowest order, we can model it by a simple frictional drag. This is the PV term that you do in simple friction. So you have an equation for the stress, and you have a force balance equation. You put that back in here. What do you get? You get an equation which is the equivalent of the Navier-Stokes equation for low Reynolds number with activity. So stare at that equation for a few minutes, and you'll realize the following. There's an active stress, active contractility. There's a gradient of the active stress. And that is the driver of the flows. What does it mean? The same equation that you had a couple of slides ago in terms of cartoons. Now you have something quantitative, suddenly. So this means I can solve this differential equation and try to see if I can match the flows. So that's what was done in this theory. So you had this profile of myosin, which was measured experimentally. You had the profile of velocity, the dots, which was measured experimentally. You know the active stress of the contractility is proportional to myosin. You can assume a linear form or a saturating form, and within error bars, you can't distinguish them. So therefore, you know the concentration profile. You can take the gradients, you can solve this equation, you can fit it, and you get an excellent match with theory and experiment. Remember, this is in a living cell, a real living cell, and each one of them becomes a nice elegant embryo later on. So you get actually numbers in microns per millimeter. This is really a two-parameter fit for the problem. Like we were discussing in some discussion group, uh, it's important to recognize how many parameters there are. So if I had about 20 data points and I have 20 parameters, I can fit anything I want. So you need to tell me how many free parameters and are they reasonable. All right, so now we come back to the big picture that we're looking at. So we now have established quantitatively that if you have active stress gradients, they'll drive flows. I mean, go back. So, we wanted patterns, then we said patterns with mechanics, and then we said mechanics, so actomyosin cortex, and we said hydrodynamic descriptions, active hydrodynamic descriptions, that we have established. How do you get patterns? Remember very easily that if you have a material which is moving around, the density of some concentration field, some morphogen field, and so on, so one way of moving around is by diffusion. That's what we discussed last class. But however, if you have flow, that's also a way of transporting material, right? Because if you have a tube of water, and the tube of water is stationary, and you put a drop of ink, it diffuses. Fine. But if the tube of water is also flowing, it will advect the ink. So there is an advective term, there is an advective transport that comes out. So you immediately recognize that if there is a way of generating flow in the system, that couples to the active stress generators, which is the molecules themselves, there could be something non-trivial that can come up. At a larger level, this is really the way to think about and this is one of the ways to think about coupling biochemistry to mechanics. Biochemistry, a la mechanotransduction, generates mechanical forces in the motor proteins and these filaments. The forces and their contractility gradients generates mechanical flows. The mechanical flows will feed back on the biochemistry. By feedback on biochemistry, I do not mean they will change the chemical interactions. The chemical interactions, remember, are also dependent on the concentration of the molecules. So if you have a way to move around molecules by some transport mechanism, you can redistribute their concentration fields, and so therefore you will re rechange their rates of reaction. There's a nice feedback that can come up. Are there patterns here? Yes, it turns out that there are very nice patterns here. So I wrote down a simple model, and let's try to go through this system. So there is one molecule, A, whose concentration I'm denoting the same letter, A, and I want to understand how does the concentration of A change with time at a given position and time. Okay, So I want to look at how does this change with time. Now remember, if the molecule does not have any chemical reactions, then you know that the total amount of material in any volume, just like the conservation law, should be conserved 
So that means this should be the gradient of some current. Right? That's exactly what we have. DDT of that is equal to current times that and just written in a differential form. Now what are the currents here? There are two parts to the current. One, there is the usual part that we learned yesterday, fixed law. There is diffusion. But here, because there are flows, there's also an advective current. That's essentially what's here. So there's an advective flux, there's a diffusive flux, and the gradient of the total flux is the time rate of change of the molecule, molecular concentration, if there are no reactions. In addition, you could have reactions. For example, think of a simple linear turnover term. So just sets the value of A to A0, nothing more than that. So with some rate K, it sets A to A0. This is exactly the reaction term that we talked about yesterday, the production term, right? The production degradation term. So if you have a molecule which is being produced at a certain rate and degraded at a certain rate, it will set the value of A to some constant determined by the rate, degradation rate and the production. That's all I have. You also recognize the following. Suppose there wasn't this advective term. There's no flux. There's no activity. I haven't told you how V comes about. I'll come to that. But if it didn't have this, then it's a diffusion equation and a linear degradation reaction. And we just worked out yesterday, this is completely stable. The homogeneous state is always the stable state. There's no patterns possible. If you take a homogeneous state, do some perturbations, it'll always come back to the homogeneous state. No patterns possible. So the only way patterns can come about is because of this advective term does something non-trivial. So how does the non-triviality come? The non-triviality comes because we say that A is the same molecule that produces an active stress, like myosin, for example. And you assume some saturating form for the stress. It increases with stress, but saturates also sometimes. And the stress gradients will generate the flows. That's the equation we established quantitatively just a few slides ago. So now there's a clean closed system. There's a transport equation for the molecule. There's a stress, there's a flow equation, and the flow feeds back on the transport. So, like I said, if no flow, this is completely stable. If there's anything non-trivial, it's coming because of the flow. Question would be, can this lead to patterns? Turns out it can. In a very intuitive manner, the way to see it is the following. So if there's a, some fluctuation in the concentration of A versus space, you know that diffusion will try to smoothen it out, flatten it out. I just said the molecule A is like myosin, which means it's contractile, so it tries to pull things in. So which means if you have a concentration profile like this, the gradient of the concentration, the gradient of the stress will have a profile like this, or letter put. So there's an opposing force, and somewhere they'll balance. That's essentially the place where the patterns go. So technically, you can do a linear stability analysis, just like we, Sandeep did in some detail, and I tried to hint at it last time for a spatial inhomogeneous state. And you can show that for some uh, strength of activity compared to diffusion, the homogeneous state is spontaneously unstable to fluctuations, and it can lead to patterns. So we can't solve this analytically, but we can do it numerically. And if you do that numerically, you find the emergence of very nice patterns in the system. So the green shading is the concentration is representative of the concentration field of A, and the arrows are representative of the uh, hydrodynamic velocity field of the system. So notice the contractile nature. So the arrows just go into the spots there. So these are stationary patterns, and again, I emphasize this is an example of mechanochemical patterns. If there was no mechanics, no patterns. It's a minimal example that you can construct. We worked on this a uh, bit more and then showed that if you have actually two species, so remember, these patterns are stationary in the sense that if you look at the long time limit, they become time independent patterns. Okay, so there's no way to generate oscillatory patterns in this. So we worked on this system a bit more and showed that if you have two species, just two species, no chemical reactions, Unlike in Turing, where you need to have activator, inhibitor, none, no such thing. Just have two of them, they diffuse differently, they get transported by the same hydrodynamic velocity field, which comes from the same equation that we know earlier. The only difference now is both of them can regulate the stress. One can increase the stress, the other can decrease the stress. We, show, we can show this very analytically, that if you have the system, this system has a spontaneous pulsatory instability, pulsatory pattern forming instability, and that comes about when you satisfy something like a Turing criteria. So if you have an up regulator, say A, and it diffuses rapidly compared to the down regulator of stress. So these are like Turing-like analogs for mechanochemical systems. So in terms of stress, up regulation and down regulation of stress, coupled with differential relaxation, in this case, relaxation by diffusion, can really generate pulsatory patterns in the system. 
just some pretty pictures. You can do it in 2D, and this time we could also show it one more way. You need not have differential diffusion. You could have the same diffusion, but if you have different rates of degradation, different rates of turnover, that's also enough to generate very nice patterns in the system. So again, a Turing-like criteria that if you have an up-regulator and it turns over faster, that is Ka is larger than Ki, that's enough to generate patterns. Yes. So if there is a, a advection term for one of the up-regulator and not for the other, so ah. do we see such patterns? Yeah, I mean you can you can build up some combinations of you cannot have diffusion, you can have only one advection, one diffusion. Typically, yes. I mean, if you satisfy this criteria, yes, you can you can work out those. Okay, I'll skip this. This is some more recent work that we've been doing. Okay, so just to get back to the picture that I was trying at the very beginning. So there are there are patterns like Turing patterns which form spontaneously in response to fluctuations. There are patterns that come about because of signaling mechanisms like the French flag model, and there's very nice regulation there. Spontaneous patterns, you don't have control on where they form, when they form. Signaling patterns like the French flag position from you have very good control because that's there's a special region. I'd like to ask what are the active mechanical analogs of signaling patterns? Are there patterns which come because of the response to certain signals that you come to some other module? And there's their robustness in the system in that sense that you can really define things very well. So to that, I turn to the last part that I want to talk about, and we are looking at the morphogenesis of C. elegans. So it turns out C. elegans is a fantastic creature, which is almost transparent, you can see through everything, and you can take out uh, the uh, fertilized egg, it's encased in an egg shell, the whole system is about 50 microns in uh, size. So if you take out this embryo and put it under a microscope and just watch it in time, it develops, and it's a beautiful system. So some one of the things that really fascinated me about living systems. How does it self-organize? And if you just watch it under the microscope, and just about 11 hours, this is real time, um, a full worm comes out. You start from a bunch of chemicals, put in a bag, and, and after some time, a real full living system, a worm comes out. Okay. So the worm hatches. No? Yes, there you go. Nowhere near all that, but we'll just start one by one. First step, let's just look at the very first cell division and try to understand what's going on. Turns out the very first cell division of this creature is an asymmetric cell division. Two daughter cells are not the same. One is bigger in size, the other is smaller in size. There's also an asymmetry in the chemical distribution of components during the cell division. There's a bunch of cells, a bunch of components go to this half, the other bunch goes to that half. This asymmetry in cell division is really driven by a certain asymmetric pattern that appears on the surface of the cell. So there's a pattern of par proteins. So these are proteins which are, which are called partitioning defective proteins. Again, the system is that you have a, a ellipsoidal shaped uh, cell. You're looking at a confocal imaging plane. So this is really the periphery of the cell. So the pattern is appearing on the periphery of the cell, not the bulk. So you start from a state which is completely red one of the power proteins, and then a uh, blue domain develops. And at the end of the day, this really defines a, a system with half red and half blue domains. And this polarity pattern really establishes the anterior posterior axis, the head tail axis of the worm. Remember, this is a problem that we said. Axis establishment is a fundamental problem in developmental biology. How do you do this very robustly? So remember, initially you had completely red. There was an axis, but there was no polarity. This end was not special compared to that. But once you establish this pattern, you know that this end is different from that end. It turns out that if you follow the lineage, this blue side also gives rise to the germ line, and the red side gives rise to the somatic line. So there's also a fate specification very early on as well. Now, at the same time, when these uh, red-blue patterns are coming up, it turns out there are flows. These are the same flows that we had quantified very early on. So if you look at the myosin, again, but this time I'm looking at the mid-plane, Look at myosin GFP tag, follow the spots of myosin, you'll see they'll concomitantly move from this pole to that pole. So you remember, flows happening on the surface of the cell. So there are flows, and then there are patterns in some polarity molecules. How do we understand this mechanobiological pattern? How do we know it's mechanics? Because you know that if you perturb the flows by doing something to myosin, I'll show that sometime later, you can really affect the patterns that come up. And so therefore, mechanics is playing an important role. It's not the most dominant role, it's, it's, it's a part of the story. What are the power proteins? 
So these are each red and blue that I showed is really a complex of proteins. So there's some uh, structure which is known. And uh, these proteins can be in two states. One, they can be bound to the membrane or they can be freely diffusing in the cytosol. So there's some exchange kinetics between the membrane and the cytosol. The chemistry of these PAR proteins is such that there are mutual phosphorylation sites on each of the two complexes. So there's a bunch of three complexes in one uh, kind of PARs and the other, some other complexes in the other kind of PARs. And there are mutual uh, phosphorylation sites in each one. What does this do? This gives rise to antagonistic interactions. What does it mean? If I have the cortex of the cell, and I look at the PAR proteins which are diffusing here, with this guy and let's say there's no other color. White guy. So whenever the white and the red, white and the green meet, they both get knocked off into the cytosol. So we're talking about the antagonistic interactions when they are on the membrane and whenever they meet each other, they like to knock off into the cytosol. So you know if you have a double negative feedback like this, that gives rise to bistability. That's what we discussed in, in uh, Sandeep's class, right? So if there's bistability and you have a spatially distributed system, like our PAR system here, where there are spatially, uh, spatial degrees of freedom in the system, it can give rise to domain patterns. So I'll explain the bistability in a moment. Just take it for granted that there is a bistability. And if you have bistability, when we talked about bistability in Sandeep's class, we talked about bistability in ODE systems. There's no spatial degrees, it was a well-mixed system. If you don't have a well-mixed system, and you have bistability in the interaction, this can lead to the existence of domain states, pattern-forming states. And so the power polarity problem is really going from a state like this, where there is a red high, blue low, homogeneous state, to a state like this, where there's a blue domain and a red domain. So I've just taken this, unwrapped it, and put it there. This is apolar, this is polar, and so establishes the head-tail axis. Let's come to the bistability. You can model the reaction diffusion patterns that come up in these PAR proteins, just like what we did uh, uh, in last class, by trying to look at reaction diffusion systems. And for the PAR proteins, there are very simple kinetics. So I said they can exist in two states, right? So they can be on the membrane or they can be in the cytosol. So obviously there will be some exchange between the two. So they can bind from the cytosol to the membrane, they can unbind from the membrane and go back to the cytosol. So there is an on rate, and there is an off rate. So A and P are the concentrations of the membrane bound part, not the cytosolic part. In addition, there is a mutual antagonism. So you, we figured out several forms in Sandeep's class of how to get in by stability by looking at the kind of reactions that are possible. Such considerations and, and very simple arguments, because we don't know much about the interactions, suggest us that there are some polynomial uh, sitting here in both the terms. And if alpha and beta are integers, if alpha and beta both are one, there's no bistability. If at least one of them is greater than one, you can show mathematically there is clear bistability. Think of the same kind of arguments that you draw the null clients, look at the intersection points. That's essentially what you're doing here. So you're plotting the full reaction term, forgetting diffusion, full reaction term of P and A, and looking at what are the points where they intersect. So just like in the class we had earlier, you can go to a parameter space, where there are three intersection points, two of them are stable, one is unstable. That's bistability. So what's the bistability that you're talking about? So if you have a spatially mixed, well-mixed system, of course, there are only two states. So there's A high or P low, A high P low or A low P high states. But if you have a spatially extended system, that means you can have a system where the molecules can also diffuse around. The possible states are that you can have a state where there's only one par high, which so is the colors, the red, the green is the same as blue. So you can have a system where spatially both the PAR proteins are homogeneous or the other way around. That's the two bistable states that are possible. But if you have a spatially extended system, you can also have states where there are domain patterns. Okay? So there are regions in parameter space where there are only homogeneous states possible and there are two kinds, that's the bistability. There are regions in parameter space where homogeneous states coexist with domain states. And the power problem is really here. You start from a state like this, red high, blue low, green low, and you go into a state of domains. So that's the problem that we are looking at. Start from a red high, completely homogeneous, put some signals, I'll tell you the signals, and the signals drive the system into a domain state. You can also mathematically show 
this will be important in the later data that I show, that we can take this system and in this domain of parameters where there is a homogeneous state coexisting with the domain state, if you want to go from the homogeneous state to the domain state, any small perturbation will not do. Because really both are stable. So if you want to go from this state to that state, there is a barrier to be crossed. There's some, it's not energetic minima, there's some minima in something, I don't know what. There's some minima where the homogeneous state is stable, there's some minima in which the domain state is stable. You want to go from here to there, a small perturbation doesn't do the job, you have to push it hard enough. You can show that uh, schematically by doing the following. You can take these partial differential equations, put in a small perturbation. Tries to form, doesn't do it. It's just below the threshold. Increase the threshold of the perturbation, and then the system, starting from a homogeneous state, and in response to some perturbation, immediately switches and goes to the domain state. So it begs the question, what is doing this transition? What's the biology of this? All this is nice in maths. That's the biology that comes up there. Turns out there are two pathways for the power system to go from a homogeneous state to a domain state. One pathway is where the centrosome associated with the male nucleus, male pronucleus, takes blue proteins, the, the PAR2 proteins, which are in the cytosol, and puts them on the surface. So remember, because A and P do not like each other, So if you just take some P and put it on the membrane, it will create a P domain. And therefore you can clear off the red domain and then the P domains and the red domains can establish and that's the polarity pattern that can come up. That's the one that we saw. The second pathway is what I call the mechanical pathway. So this is a pathway where the same male pronucleus locally depletes myosin at the posterior pole. I'm not showing a lot of data, we have measured these data very, very carefully. It locally depletes myosin at the posterior pole. So if it locally depletes myosin somewhere, there's a profile of myosin, which means there's a profile of active contractility, which means there's a flow. That's what we have characterized very strongly earlier. So the flow will therefore push off the red protein, and then the blue protein can come up, and the whole thing starts. This is how I do a lot of hand-waving, but let's get on to the details now. That there are two pathways, and they seem to be redundant. Either can do the job, but on physiological time scales, this is slow. It still does it, it's about 100-200 seconds slow, but in combination with both of them, you get the right thing for the wild time. Now, one thing is to build up a mathematical model like this, show some solutions of that, and which looks like the data that you get in the movies. Uh, the other thing is that one can actually do what we do in physics, that you write down a theory, make some predictions, and so therefore can say things like A varies with B in some fashion, A is a function of B. So that really gives a mathematical curve. And so if you know the parameters of the system, you actually can get numbers, quantitative numbers in real physical units. And so if you can get quantitative physical units, in the, uh, data in such units, one would be really tempted to, to compare theory and experiment very quantitative. And so to do that, you need to get data, and very, very hard data. So this is a result of four years of work. I started this when I was there in Dresden in the last year. We've been collaborating for four years now. Extensive uh, work by Peter Gross, who is a postdoc in Dresden, has, has resulted in the following. So we can take images like this, on focal images, you remember, you're looking at the mid-plane, and we can do the following. Look at the profile across the membrane, we can look at the concentration profiles. So remember, this is a red herring, this is the polar body, forget that. You're really looking at the concentration outside the cell to the inside of the cell, and so we can look at the concentration profile and we can figure out where is the membrane, or where is the cortex at that point. We can cut it open digitally, and so therefore can get the profile of the proteins across the periphery of the cell, both the proteins, the red and the blue. We can calibrate it with known concentrations, so if, therefore if you know uh, fluorescent levels, you can convert it to concentrations in real units. And so therefore what you end up with is a profile of the red and the blue protein in terms of the number of proteins per micron square on the surface of the cell. That's a real number, that's a density. We can do the same thing for myosin because that's the thing we know is generating the flows. For myosin, we can also do particle imaging velocimetry. That's how we have done these quantification of the flows. And so therefore, what we can do is that take images like this in the microscope and convert it to data like that. So these are solutions. I mean, okay, it's not solutions. Let's go. These are real data of two power proteins, the red and blue proteins, myosin motor protein, 
and finally the hydrodynamic velocity field on the surface of the embryo. So these are averaged over several embryos, there's a very good consistency and also some spatiotemporal averaging uh, to get very good statistics. We have very, very good statistics. Each point is the result of you know, 10,000 points within there. So there's very, very good statistics, there's space-time resolution and yet the pattern is very, very robust. So you can immediately see several things coming up here. So you start from homogeneous red and blue states and myosin is also homogeneous and it's hard to see the chemical cue, the mechanical cue is very clear. So look at myosin, starts out flat at t equal to zero and there'll be a dip in myosin. The dip in myosin, if you watch the movie again, will create a profile of flow. There you go. The profile of flow will drive out the red parts and so therefore the blue parts can come in and then the domain establishes. How do we understand this mechanobiological pattern quantitatively? So that's where we build in the model. First, we build a schematic model. We say that there are proteins which can be bound on the membrane, A and P, anterior and posterior pass, and myosin. They can also be in the cytosol. And so there's some exchange kinetics on the cytosol. While they are on the membrane, they can move around by diffusion on the membrane itself, or they can also get advected by the flows, the active hydrodynamic flows that I discussed earlier. Now, the proteins also are... Um, Bistable, uh, they form bistable interactions because they are mutually antagonistic interactions resulting from mutual phosphorylation. This system, like I said, can be triggered by two signals from the centrosome. One directly loads R2 molecules, the blue guys, onto the membrane. The other locally reduces myosin here. So this pathway is the reduction of the myosin uh, pathway. This pathway is the introduction of the part 2 onto the membrane part. This system gets triggered and that's how the domains are coming up to get more quantitative. We actually worked out some FRAP data, I'm not going into the details because of the lack of time, and we found out that there's an effective interaction between myosin and one of the parts, and at the end of the day, it turns out that one of the parts regulates the off rate of myosin. We've done extensive data by looking at FRAP in various domains of the system and quantifying this data very, very carefully. So what it turns out is that one of the parts regulates the off rate of myosin. In fact, it inhibits the off rate of myosin. Therefore, effectively, it puts on myosin onto the membrane. That's all is the system, schematically. But we write down mathematical modeling for this. So how do we do that? Same picture like we did earlier. So we have a reaction diffusion model. There's reactions, there's diffusion. In addition, we have advection. Those are the things that I built here for the mechanical model there. And the mechanics comes in because one of them is a motor protein, myosin, generates flows via the same equation that we established quantitatively, these flows feed back into the system, and that's how the pattern is coming up somehow. We write down a theory, we write down partial differential equations for the concentration fields of the two power proteins and myosin, and finally the flow. So this system as a whole has my stability, has spontaneous pattern forming states, all of the mechanochemical patterns that I showed, all kinds of things. But where is the wild type? Where is the real system? What is the parameters of the wild type which ensures robustness here? What's the, what's the physics in the biology here? So remember, I told you the power pattern and typical patterns in developmental biology do not happen spontaneously. They happen because certain signals come which tell you where to make the pattern, when to make the pattern. And so where are those things? Those are the ones that are coming from the two pathways. The two pathways are really like guides. So they do two things, like I said, one of the pathways regulates the off rate of myosin and so loads, sorry, regulates the off rate of the posterior path and loads posterior part onto the membrane. The other pathway locally down regulates myosin and so creates profiles of myosin, so flow and so the pattern. So that's the full set of partial differential equations that I have. So there's a very nice modular structure and this we will use when we do some perturbations to the system. There's a part which is involving the polarity proteins there's a part that's involving the mechanochemical aspect of the actomyosin cortex, myosin and flow, the two path proteins. Okay. So now we have these complicated PDEs and then we have data. Um, you can foolishly ask, can you fit this uh, theory with the experimental data that you have? And anybody should be able to say, uh, you have a horrible number of parameters, so I can fit anything to anything. Right? Sure. There's a very nice parable that goes in physics. So that says if you have a theory with four parameters, you can fit an elephant. And if you have five, you can make him wiggle his trunk. So I have much more than five, right? There's a nice proof of this. I really urge you to take a look at this paper by a bunch of very well-known biologists. 
take a look at this paper. So I have to tell you how many parameters do I have in the system. Turns out I don't have so many independent parameters. So if you actually tabulate all the parameters and find out what do we know and what do we not know, except the ones which are shaded, we know all the other parameters, either from previous literature or we can measure them experimentally. Simple on-off rates, diffusion coefficients can be done by FRAP or FCS, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. So we know those numbers. By doing flow estimates and things like that, the earlier one, we know the parameters of the cortex, like the viscosity, the effective active stress, and so on and so forth. There are a few parameters which we really don't know much about. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Oh, I can still fit an elephant. So there are eleven parameters in the system. So I should be careful about that. So here's where the power of genetics and the modularity of the system comes into play. So remember I said there is a nice modularity because there is a patterning system in terms of the parity proteins and there's a mechanochemical system in terms of myosin and the flows. So we can use my, uh, C. elegans genetics, which we will know extremely well, to reduce the complexity of the system and fit parts and then ask if the whole can be explained. So we do something called MLC4 RNAi. My MLC4 RNAi is myosin light chain kinase. This really regulates the Rorock pathway of the activity of myosin. So if you knock off MLC4, it really uh, knocks off the activity of myosin. Myosin is there, it's not contractile, it doesn't generate contractile forces. In terms of equations, effectively myosin is not there because it's not interacting with the polarity protein. So therefore I can knock off the myosin equation, I can knock off the flow equation, and I can also knock off the flow transport in the power polarity equation because there's no flow anymore. We have quantified this, the flow is orders of magnitude slower compared to the wild type. So we knock off that. Now it turns out I don't have many parameters left. I only have four parameters. Now I can't fit an elephant. So if I can actually compare the data and the theory and I can get good results, I can trust my data. In fact, you can take this PDE, solve it. This is a nonlinear PDE, so we can't solve it analytically, we solve it numerically. We can do parameter inference. We've done it by various nonlinear least squares fitting methods. We've also done it by Bayesian parameter instance. And then try to compare and optimize parameters, which gives you very good agreement with the data. Once you do that, you get movies like this. So there's experimental data, and the theory curves are the solid lines that are there. So we see we can actually match the pattern very quantitatively, even the numbers. Remember, these are numbers of proteins per micrometer square, number of proteins per micrometer square on the surface of the cell. If you do this, you fix some parameters here by doing the fitting. You optimize some of the fit, and so therefore you fix some parameters. Now we can use the other part of the modularity. We can knock off the par polarity, uh, par proteins themselves. So we do double RNA of both the pars, and so there are no pars, and so there's no polarity pattern. That's fine. We just want to establish some physical parameters of the active mechanical thing. So we look at myosin and flow, so therefore we knock off the pars. We have only myosin and flow. We can measure both the myosin and flow, and then we can again fit the data. So again, this is some three parameter or four parameter fit, not much. So immediately you get into a situation where you have fixed the active mechanochemical parameters. So there's regulation rates of myosin, there's activity of cortex, the viscosity of the cortex, and so on. You finally come to a situation where you realize that there are no free parameters in the system. You fix some parameters by looking at the polarity part alone, some other parameters by looking at the active mechanics alone, and now you come to the wild type, and you realize you fixed every parameter in the system. And so your heart should pound and ask, can you predict the wild type numerically without doing any experimental fitting, without doing any fitting to the experimental data? We were not expecting this, but it turns out you can actually do that. No fitting here. Every part of the system we have modularly obtained by doing different uh, fitting. We just put in the parameters into the partial differential equation, crank the numerics, put it on top of the data. We don't do it perfect, it's not as great as the earlier fits, but we do get the correct length scales, correct time scales, and correct number of uh, proteins per micrometer square and the flow velocities. So we can do the fitting for this as well, and optimize and get a better fit, and then ask how much do the parameters change. They change by 5-10%. This is extremely acceptable in biology. So remember this thing I told you about. So we have done this, we know all the parameters of the system. So I told you that if you are in the system parameter regime, where there are bistability in the system, this can lead to domain states. And in the regime where there are both homogeneous states and domain states, going from the homogeneous state to the domain state requires perturbation beyond a certain threshold. We can verify this experimentally. How do we do that? 
we look at the following. We look at the flow velocities in the wild type, and we look at the flow velocities when you do double RNA. So the flow velocities seem to be reduced by half. We can genetically knock off this pathway. That is, we engineer R2 proteins, which do not talk to microtubules, and so therefore cannot be loaded by the male pronucleus. And so therefore, this pathway doesn't exist. So there's only a mechanical pathway. And mechanical pathway, we can do a gradual MLC4 RNA. You don't do a large scale thing. You gradually reduce the strength of the activity of myosin, which means you slowly reduce the active contractile flows. And you find that as soon as you keep doing that, somewhere around three to four microns as the maximum flow velocity, the system can no longer polarize. So which means you are somewhere in this situation. And by doing this, you reduce the strength of the perturbation, the signal. And so, therefore, you go into a system where you cannot polarize. Theoretically, we know this, right? So, we've fixed all parameters for the wild type. In fact, we've predicted the spatiotemporal evolution of the patterns. And we can ask the following, can I reproduce this flow threshold as well? Assuming that when you're doing MLC4 RNAi, you're only changing the strength of the active contractility term. There's an assumption, we don't know, but it's justified because you're changing the myosin activity. Assuming you're doing that, you can just take all the parameters of the file type, nothing to fit, just titrate the value of the active stress. That's it. And just see where are the velocities below which it doesn't polarize. We can hit it spot on. So somewhere around four microns, the theory also predicts above four microns per minute, the maximum peak to peak flow velocity, the system can polarize, and below that, it cannot polarize. And Mirage is really spot on with the experimental data. What do we learn from all this? Yeah, so one more thing. Not only the first order uh, uh, theory, but uh, I mean, for, for, for people who know what it meant by correlation functions and all. So we can actually take these uh, um, uh, experimental data and calculate the two-point correlation functions of the PARS, part two with PAR6, part two with NMY2, part six with NMY2, so on and so forth. This is just experimental data. And since we have fixed the theory and all the parameters, one can ask, does the theory also reproduce the correlation functions? And it turns out it's pretty good. It's not as good as the, as the averages, so I don't want to put them on top of each other, but it's, it's pretty good. We didn't even expect that this is something uh, which will reproduce the two-point functions as well. Okay, so what do we learn from all this? Now, this is a system where the polarization pattern is coming up in response to two signals. There are two pathways, a mechanical pathway and a chemical pathway, and those two signals come at a specific time. Why? Where? Because it's really associated with the male pronucleus, and when the male pronucleus comes near the posterior pole is when the signal starts. So you do not polarize until you get the signal. That ensures robustness in when you start the pattern. So a way to think about it is that you have a system which is switchable, can go from a domain state to a, a homogeneous state to a domain state, and it operates far from spontaneous instabilities. How do we know this? You know all the parameters of the system. We can do a standard linear stability analysis, all the things that we do in classical physics, and work out where are the spontaneous pattern forming regions of the parameter space. So this is where the patterns form spontaneously. And in this regime, the signals are not strong enough to induce polarity. And the wild type parameters are sitting nicely in a safe regime. They do not polarize spontaneously, but they are good enough to polarize in response to a strong signal. Remember, this is a logarithmic scale. It's pretty hard. Once you do this, you can crank up the machinery of uh, dynamical systems theory and ask questions like, are there bifurcations? Are there steady states? Are there homogeneous states and domain states? Where is the separatrix? Where is the basin of attraction? All these things can be cranked up. So we can do that, and what we find is that the following thing. So there are a fixed point, which is the fixed point of the homogeneous state. There's a fixed point of domain states, and there is some barrier, there is some separate tricks to be crossed. So spontaneous fluctuations cannot take the system from here to here. But you can take a guide which will try to push the system, which are really the signals that are coming in from the male pronucleus, and that thing can actually take the system and put it apart. So here's the picture. So the picture is that if you take the system from the homogeneous state, drive it by the signals, space-time dependent signals, but if you switch off the signals quick enough, or if the signals are not strong enough, and you leave out the signal, the system comes back to the homogeneous state. This is the response of the small fluctuations that are there. But if the system is strong enough and just makes it cross the threshold, and then leaves the system back, 
it spontaneously self organizes but this time forms a domain state this is a way to ensure robustness in when to form the pattern okay so that's the analogy uh, that i talked about so there are patterns in reaction diffusion systems in response to signals or multiple signals or spontaneous self organizing things like your turing patterns there are mechanical mechanochemical analogs of the spontaneous pattern forming things these are the things that we talked about and then there are mechanochemical analogs of the things which respond in response to certain signals so that really defines your coordinate system ensures robustness and so on and so forth but remember i'll just take two more minutes and i'll finish off i just want to summarize the current research that we do i really started by asking questions like how do you shape the embryo how do you get patterns in shape now we have understood some sort of a picture of trying to understand these kinds of patterns coming from reaction diffusion or mechanical chemical things but the shape is still fixed if you have reaction diffusion patterns there's no mechanics in them there's no stress in them and so therefore there's no way to mold the embryo there's no there's nothing to shape them but if you have mechanical chemical patterns there's a stress already there and the stress is intrinsically involved in patterning the system now the statement is just take this guy use that stress they form the object and so the deformation will act back on the patterns and so on and so forth we want to construct toy models for this we want to construct toy models to understand the physics and the mathematics and then we can go on to the real systems where you can get this kind of a data so that's the picture so you have an active material formed of motor proteins patterns in concentration fields patterns in orientation fields think of microtubule patterns that olivia showed last week you take a sphere put them on some uh, get out some patterns the patterns have a stress associated with them use the stress to deform the object so we've been building this uh, this is really recent work we've been building this with uh, uh, group members where we write down these hydrodynamic equations on curved manifolds arbitrary curved manifolds this is really trying to solve fluid dynamics on curved surfaces a hard problem and uh, we try to set up numerical methods by using finite element methods and so on and we have been testing this let me skip this for the lack of time and we can get very nice patterns on curved surfaces now the other thing to ask is that if you have patterns coming from reaction diffusion systems they are not so sensitive to the shape of the surface it's only the diffusion operator mechanics on the other hand is super sensitive to shape and so therefore the shape should really pick up and it turns turn out so if you have an oblate ellipsoid and doing these pattern forming systems on an oblate ellipsoid gives you some patterns which picks up at the pole but if you do the same thing on a prolate ellipsoid immediately it turns out we are this is something we are working on um the system really chooses certain regions of the shape where curvature is maximized something like that i don't know what that is exactly this is really robust to different initial conditions something that we are working on some of pretty pictures we have done this for various shapes as well and even there it turns out that you can get very nice looking patterns which really pick out the shape of the surface and things like uh, what upal was talking about looking at the gaussian curvature and what are the things that these patterns are picking out something that we are working on okay so that's the summary so i tried to talk about morphogenesis in general and try to look at how patterns come up in concentration fields order parameter fields flow fields and so on there can be patterns which come spontaneously in response to fluctuations or they can couple to signaling and so therefore these signals can regulate the patterns and there are patterns that finally can come up in geometry as well that's something we are exploring i'll stop there questions a uh, very general point having to do with patterns which are generated as a result of local interactions which later give you some sort of coordinated image of the entire uh, system versus patterns which are generated from as you said special signaling centers and so forth now the second kind of pattern do you know of any example where it exists in either a multicellular or multinucleate system as opposed to a system consisting of a single cell maybe a large cell and cytoplasm alone for example many of these payment mongol kind of things uh, signaling centers in the fish or frog i don't know if people have so those are single cell situation no, 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 at the multicellular level as well yeah but the spe- the organizer there is a single cell but it sends out signals which yeah but it comes out via inter- pre existing interactions so what i meant was do you really have something like the bicoid system but 
in a situation involving many cells or many nuclei? I, I don't know any definite example. But I guess there must be, but I don't know. I don't know that. I, I don't think any are known. That's the, I, to my knowledge. So I was interested I don't whether know. you knew any. Because it's also not a single, I mean, it's, it's, it's really a syncytial nuclei that form. Yes. And then the membranes come up later on. It's becomes a syncytium later, but the initial deposition is maternal, as you know. It's maternal, but it's, it's really not a multinucleated, <coughs> sorry, it's not a multicellular thing. At the, I don't know. I don't know any example. Uh, so, yeah, so the. Mechanical, mechanochemical patterns, you only have them with contractibility and diffusion, right? So is there any prediction of what would happen with uh, uh, contractibility and also chemical reactions? Oh, like, and I mean, that only adds to the complexity of the problem. Sure, uh, there are many toy examples. You can take classical Turing patterns, which come because of reaction diffusion system, put in active mechanochemical things via the cortex, and then look at how, where are the patterns. Mechanics really modifies the diag phase diagrams, and the reasons where you get patterns and all. Must be the case that in, even in the actomyosin system, actomyosin must be regulated by a lot of signals. You have lots of other proteins which talk to them, which really do reaction diffusion chemistry. They're not motor proteins, but they can talk to the ones that form the motor proteins. There must be examples of that. I, I just built things where there is no diffusion, so, so there's no reaction, so as to show that you can get in principle patterns by just mechanics. If you couple them, of course, you get a much, much richer diagram. Can you please uh, elaborate more on active stress? I mean, it's a constant quantity that you're taking in your interpretations, or no. depends on? No, it's not a constant quantity. I said it's a quantity which depends on the local amount of myosin in some small one. Now, the local amount of myosin could be different in different amounts of molecule. Therefore, there's a profile of myosin, which means there's a profile of the active stress. And the amount of myosin could also change with time, because it moves around, it diffuses, it talks to other signals. And so therefore, the active stress will also be a function of space and time. It's not something I put in by hand, it's something which comes out because of the motor activity of myosin. No more questions? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again.